Welcome to Stand in the Gap Today with your host, the Honorable Sam Rohrer, President of the American Pastors Network, addressing the most pressing issues impacting our economy, our homes, our churches, our culture, and our daily lives from a biblical and constitutional perspective. Stand in the Gap Today, transforming the culture one heart at a time. Well, hello and welcome to this special Friday program and our monthly culture update and uh with um, our special guest, who you all know and love, really Dr. George Barna, author, speaker, researcher, and current professor at Arizona Christian University, where he's also there serving as the director of research at the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian. Now, in every culture, it seems in every age, there have always been what we refer to as champions, right? Don't we all want to be a champion? Well, in the Bible, you know, the word champion only occurs three times, and it occurs all in one book, the book of First Samuel. And all of those references are in reference to one man, an egocentric, God-rejecting, and arrogant, six-fingered giant called Goliath. Yeah, you know, he was an idol-worshiping Pal- uh, Philistine champion. But that champion was felled by a single stone hurled from the sling of a young boy named David. In the minds of the people then, this boy became the champion of the champion, David, a true hero. As the world goes, champions come and champions go. People clamor for champions. They often sadly pursue uh, folks like Saul, as they did in the days of Goliath because he looked good and he was tall, but it makes a difference how one determines and defines champion. For instance, the, the modern definition, that the contemporary definition of champion is this. Let me give it to you. It's a person who has defeated or surpassed all rivals in a competition. The Webster's 1829 Dictionary, which embodies a mostly biblical worldview of words, uh, defines champion, though, differently. See if you can identify the difference with what I just said. The contemporary is someone who has defeated or surpassed all rivals in a competition. Now, here is the more the original definition. A man who undertakes a combat in the place or cause of another. Now, the definition occurring then was a hero, a brave warrior. This is all part of the definition at Webster's 1829. Goes on to say, hence, one who is bold in contest as a champion for the truth. Can you tell the difference? Well, as I considered these definitions, it's obvious how things have so changed and how as true Bible-believing Christians, we must understand the nuances of the concept of champion and instill those differences into our children. So in today's program with Dr. George Barnum, we're going to build out what it means to be a champion, how to develop true champions within our children, why it's important to do so, and then conclude with a challenge to all parents and grandparents and pastors and church leaders of how to do it better. So the title I've chosen for today's program is not my title. It's really the title of George's latest book coming out next Tuesday, available on Amazon, entitled Raising Spiritual Champions. And then in smaller print on the cover of that book, it says, Nurturing Your Child's Heart, Mind, and Soul. So today, Isaac and I are going to talk with George about his latest book and hopefully encourage, challenge, and inspire all of you who are listening and watching us today to do all we can to raise spiritual champions. And with that, George, welcome to the program. Great to have you back. Yeah, it's always wonderful to be with you both. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, George, knowing you as I do, I'm sure you labored extensively in regard to how you entitled your latest book, which I understand to be, George, your 60th book, which you have now authored or co-authored. And to that, I say, praise the Lord. I really mean that, George. Praise the Lord for you for allowing... Uh, the Lord to take and use the gifts that He's given you. That's an amazing, amazing thing. Uh, I I, I will say, though, I've not been able to read your book. It's brand new. I have a a preprint copy. I have quickly skimmed it. But I do know how carefully you define terms. And uh, I I gave that 
contemporary definition of champion, which I read it to equate to champions achieving ultimate victory in terms of opposition, victory and defeat. But that Webster definition, if I read that correctly, uh, seems to uh, denote champion there to uh, actually matters of character and heart and soul and mind, as in boldness, bravery, including the definition, hence, a champion for the truth. So uh, those are my brief thoughts, George. But tell us your thoughts about the title and the focus of the book. Would you do that, please? Well, yeah, it's really an allusion to the kind of preparation and commitment that's required to be a champion of any type. It doesn't just happen. You really have to devote yourself to becoming that kind of person. And so the title of the book was meant to help us refocus, recenter our focus on faith more than the things that our culture today sees as being the things that lead to being a champion, things like feelings and reputation and achievements. Uh, it, it really, raising spiritual champions is about facilitating passionate discipleship of Jesus Christ. And so it's a, about making a commitment to being Christ-like, where we look at childhood as a time of preparation for life as a devout follower and servant of Jesus Christ. And so I'm hoping that that title arrests people attention long enough to say, spiritual champion, my child? I mean, that's something that almost comes out of nowhere in our culture. And yet, if you go back in time and you look at Jesus' ministry, his pronouncements, you look at scriptural admonitions, children are to become spiritual champions in order for them to live that kind of life. Of it, and, and it did catch my attention as a father of three uh, children, a teenager, a middle schooler, and an elementary age child. It, it caught my attention. I've pre-ordered the book. Actually, I was able to look at the PDF now, too. But uh, th- this idea, you know, it's your 60th book, and you decide to write on this. We're, we're running out of time, but what motivated you to write on this? It, as many books as you've written, why, why this? Why now? I don't have that much time left on earth, I suspect. I don't know when the Lord will call me home, but I want to finish strong. And so I sat back and tried to figure out, uh, with each new book I write, I've got to figure, if this is the last book that I'm able to put out, what's going to make the biggest difference? And when I look at the nature of our culture, and I understand the role that children play in the unfolding of not only today's culture, but the future of America, the world, the church, people's lives, children are such a critical element. And so I wanted to have a book that took what I do most effectively, I think, which is to do research and then help people figure out how do we apply what we learn from the research and take that into this realm of how do we raise children up to be disciples? Uh, Because children are developing their worldview. That's going to carry them for the rest of their life. It's going to determine who they are, how they live, what impact they have, what kind of culture they facilitate. And anything I can do to help them do things that will honor God, that's what I want to do. Raising spiritual champions. Your children, ladies and gentlemen, you know, not every child can go out and win a battle and be a champion, but they all could and can be spiritual champions. That's the focus of George's book to come out next week, available on Amazon. We come back, we're going to begin walking through the book and give you a highlight of what is in it. We'll look at children as future champions in the next segment. From the time our children are born until the moment they leave our homes as young adults, Christian parents are given the privilege and responsibility of guiding them into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All during their growing years, they are influenced by the people and events around them. Sometimes these are out of our control, but many times we can make choices as to how they'll be educated, what church they'll attend, and the overall atmosphere of our home. If you've decided your child is best influenced by a biblical worldview education, you'll want to consider BJU Press homeschool materials. Dedicated to academic excellence, BJU Press offers a curriculum that not only assists you to pass along your values to your children, but makes it easy and affordable. The decisions made in response to the challenges and opportunities your child will face in life are largely determined by their internal spiritual compass. Is your child ready for the journey? Find out more at bjupress.com. That's bjupress.com. 
For years, faithful Christians formed nonprofit foundations or trusts to preserve their ability to generously give to their favorite causes or ministries, even after their death. The problem? Professional managers, pressure from left-wing agendas, and even family members with opposing views hijacked the original donor intent. This is sad, but true. But this subversion of purpose can be prevented. Hello, I'm Sam Rohr of the American Pastors Network, and I'm glad to recommend Capstone Legacy Foundation in Wayne, Pennsylvania, an experienced and capable Christian community foundation. Established to help you set up a ministry, a giving structure guaranteed not to be hijacked, or a place you can donate cash or non-cash assets like stocks, bonds, or property, Capstone's designed to help you achieve immediate tax savings and give you needed time to decide how to prayerfully allocate your giving. Contact Capstone at 610-688-8890 or visit them at capstonelegacy.org. Can our nation be blessed once again? Yes, if we again glorify God in our lives, laws, and culture. When that happens, God's blessings flow. Hello, I'm Sam Rohr with another Stand in the Gap Minute. This week we've looked at the traits of a nation blessed by God. These blessings include health, abundance, peace, and respect. They result when God is honored, revered, and obeyed by our people and our leaders. As a nation, Israel was highly blessed by God. America was once also. Deuteronomy 14.9 says, The Lord will establish you as the head and not the tail, if you obey my words. It's one thing to read scripture. It's another to live it. It's one thing to say, in God we trust. It's another thing to mock the God who blessed us. A nation blessed of God will be a nation who honors God and is grateful to Him. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Discover more at AmericanPastorsNetwork.net. Did humans live with dinosaurs? This is Ken Ham, general editor of the book Glass House, Shattering the Myth of Evolution. All this week, we've been looking at dinosaurs through the lens of Scripture. We've learned that, yes, starting with God's Word, dinosaurs and man lived with each other. But is there any evidence of this? Yes, cultures all around the world have legends of dragons. These dragons sound a lot like dinosaurs. How did dozens of cultures isolated from one another until recently all come up with legends of the same creatures independently? And the art of these cultures features some of these creatures. They're recognizable as Brachiosaurus, Stegosaurs, and other dinosaurs. Dinosaurs didn't die out millions of years ago. They lived with man until recently. Dinosaurs aren't a mystery at all when you start with God's Word. Get answers to dinosaurs and so much more when you visit us at AnswersRadio.com. That's AnswersRadio.com. You're listening to Stand in the Gap today. For more information, visit our website at StandInTheGapRadio.com. Well, if you're just joining us today, this is our uh, monthly culture update with uh, special guest Dr. George Barna. And today we're not dealing so much with um, uh, current research as much as um, a lot of the research put together but focused on a very specific subject. The title uh, of the program is Raising Spiritual Champions, and that is the title of the latest new book coming out under the authorship of Dr. George Barna and available. This is on Friday, next week, next Tuesday of next week. It will be available uh, on Amazon. And we're going through and just giving you a little bit of a quick overview of uh, this book, what it's about, uh, Raising spiritual champions. Now, we're going to talk about children here now, and that's what the book is about. But throughout Scripture, uh, children are valuable. Uh, they're, they're not valuable in this secular world. They, we kill them in the womb by millions, right? But to God, children are valuable, and they're to be very carefully nurtured In God's design, children are the fruit of the union between husband and wife, a gift of God, a gift of God owned by God. A lot of people don't know this. Owned by God, but loaned to parents. Why? To be raised up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And according to Jesus himself, New Testament, we read this, children are never to be abused, casually just turned aside or harmed. And that, in doing so, was so 
Well, if so punishable, Jesus said, let an anchor be tied around that guy's neck, that perpetrator, and then drowned in the depth of the sea. It's very serious. So as human parents are to care and train up with all diligence, God's gifts loaned to them, uh, we are continually reminded that if we are true believers in Jesus Christ, we ourselves as adults, uh, our children, we become adopted, adopted as children of God into God's family with a lot of other people that go all the way back into the Old Testament, all those who believed in God by faith, unique, loved, and made joint heirs with Jesus Christ himself, uh, all of us with the same eternal Abba Father who perfectly demonstrates to us how we should emulate to our children. Now, that's God's design. Wow, does it work well and it's done well. Uh, George, your book's first section, I know it has three chapters in it with the first one describing the importance of children. I just tried to describe it just a little bit. Could you briefly summarize, uh, add to what I said, detract from it, whatever, but briefly summarize how in your book you, you make the importance of children revealed? Yeah, I mean, and there are a lot of scriptures that talk about how critical children are in the eyes and to the heart of God. Uh, You know, one of the ways that we can think about it, because Americans tend to be very practical, is we can take those scriptures and kind of translate them into how we live. And so we can begin to recognize that childhood is a period of time where who we become as adults is facilitated. And so part of that is the development of our worldview. Part of it is understanding and pursuing different commitments that will be important to us for the rest of our life and define us. But there are things like our worldview, things like whether or not we choose to and commit to becoming a disciple of Jesus, whether or not we choose to acknowledge our sins and confess them and ask Jesus Christ to save us from the consequences of those sins. That typically all takes place before the age of 13. Why? Because each of us is born with a kind of spiritual vacuum that will be filled by something. And so it's the role of parents and grandparents and family to help our children to fill that vacuum with the things of God, the ways of God, the history of God, the understanding of God, the calling from God. So parents have the primary responsibility for helping children to become who they're going to be as adults, recognizing, as you pointed out, that children are a gift, and that raising a spiritual champion for a parent, that's a a, a deep, profound commitment. Why do children matter? Because they're our future leaders of the church, our future leaders of the nation and the world. They are our, as parents or grandparents, eternal legacy. And so we want to build that legacy as well as we can. And while we're here, they're a source of joy, and we want to set them up for success by having that potential deep relationship with God, being able to know him, love him, serve him with all their heart, mind, strength, and soul. It doesn't just happen. We have to facilitate that. Well, and and that's exactly where my wife and I are right now. We are trying to facilitate that in our children. And we just started up uh, the new school year. We homeschool. We use the BJU Press curriculum with that biblical worldview. But we try to incorporate it into all parts of our life, what we're doing at church, what we're doing at home. And we fail a lot of times, and, and our kids know that. But we try to show them, you know, what we, you know, what what we do when that happens. But I'm just so excited about this book, um, about but you just making this an emphasis. My whole uh, life, just about since I was a child, I've been involved in children's ministry. And, and I get invited sometimes to speak for children, you know, large children events. Um, I was just uh, down this summer at a, a large church in the Southeast, and um, I was speaking for some things, representing American Pastors Network and whatnot. And they said, oh, and we know, you know, that you do a lot of kids. Can you also speak to our kids groups, these different kids groups? And I love that. I, I love talking with kids, teaching them. And one of the things I... Um, I started learning uh, as a young pastor, and you were one of the ones that, that informed me of this, 
is I, I kind of, there was, I don't know where it came from, but I kind of had this idea that the closer that a, a young person gets to graduating high school and going to college, that's when you can start to actually talk theology to them and teach them about Christian life. And that's not right at all. Um, you, you and some other godly men have shown me what, what I think the Lord had already put in my heart before. And, and, and that the, the reality is the, the time period to train a, a, a person in the things of the Lord is actually younger not older. I, I don't want to give away everything, but your second chapter in this book is about doing ministry to children, which is, again, so close to my heart, something even as a pastor, church planter has always been a part of my ministry. Um, when you look at it from your research, I'm very curious because I've been in hundreds of different churches and, and made my own kind of anecdotal things, but through your research, how healthy is the average church ministry? How healthy is children's ministry in the American church today? You know, it, it, that was one of the seven original pieces of research we did for the book, was to try to figure out, you know, how healthy is ministry to children across, in churches across the country, and then to identify certain ones that are healthy, figure out what they're doing, how they do it. And I, I, there are some great children's ministries in America, but the big picture is that we're failing miserably. And a large part of that is because we don't take children seriously. We don't think that you can actually minister in a meaningful way to children other than to, you know, play games, make them feel happy, make them feel secure, make them feel comfortable, as opposed to getting busy with the real truth of Scripture and helping children to unpack it from a very young age. Because by the time they reach the age of 13, they will have established their philosophy of life, their worldview. They will have had to address all the big questions of life. Now, they may not do it in a real sophisticated fashion, but we can come alongside them and help them understand it. So we know that seven out of eight children's pastors do not have a biblical worldview. We know you can't give what you don't, what you don't have. And so therefore, literally most children in Christian churches on any given Sunday may well be led astray by pastors, people that the church has sanctioned to be the teachers, leaders, models for our children. We know that only 2% of parents have a biblical worldview, so they're not going to get the job done. You know, and then we look at what's going on with our children, and when we look at 13- and 14-year-olds, the fruit of children's ministry, what we know is that most children in America today who are 13 or 14 do not believe in God. They don't believe that there is a God who exists, who's all-knowing, all-powerful, created the world, still rules it today, is involved in our lives. Uh, in fact, a higher proportion are what we would call part of the don'ts. People don't know if God exists, don't care if God exists, uh, don't believe that he exists. 43% of our young people are in that category versus only 36% who believe in the God of Scripture. You know, most of them believe that Jesus may have sinned. Most of them don't believe that Satan exists. A huge majority of them don't believe in absolute moral truth. You know, and on and on and on. I've got all the data in the book. But, yeah, I mean, by and large, we are failing in children's ministry today. And so if we just keep doing what we're doing now, we're going to continue to fail. And uh, George, we don't. Uh, we we're out of time to. Uh, uh, <laughs> we can't keep failing, uh, and and we're about out of time in this segment. So I'm not going to be asking any question. But I know your third chapter, in this first segment, then gets into the Great uh, Commission, which moves us into discipleship, which you and Isaac and I have talked so much on this program about. I know you've identified the fact that one of the failures of the church, over the years, is not making disciples. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as parents or grandparents, uh, it's not just the church's responsibility to make disciples. It's actually us as parents and grandparents. Now, I'm a parent of <laughs> six children, and uh, thank the Lord I just had my 17th grandchild. Uh, wow. But I can tell you, they they are responsible to me, and I still have not given up my responsibility as a grandparent to my grandchildren. Now, that's what the Bible says, but discipleship, what we're doing with our children, 
is what George is going to talk about in the second segment in his book, Raising, Raising Spiritual Champions. We'll be right back. Family, commerce, civil authority, the church. Did you know these are the four pillars of society that God ordained to be the distributors, demonstrators, and protectors of truth? It's time to raise the biblical standard for each of these institutions once again. The American Pastors Network and its media ministries, Stand in the Gap Radio and TV, are using their national platform to analyze and evaluate today's cultural issues from a biblical and constitutional perspective. When you tune into Stand in the Gap today, or watch an episode of Stand in the Gap TV, you'll hear information ranging from the latest news headlines to the exciting fulfillment of prophecy in the Middle East. Guests like former Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, apologist Alex McFarland, and Citizens Council for Health Freedom's Twyla Brace offer insights from their valuable experience to help you better understand and defend your faith. To tune in, visit us at standinthegapmedia.org. That's standinthegapmedia.org. The United States boasts over 4 million miles of highways and public roads. Without accurate maps, though, and road signs, these roads are confusing. The road of life's no different. Thankfully, the Bible gives us needed markers and guidelines in the form of biblical commands and principles. Properly applying them is the difference between success and confusion when it comes to impacting our culture for Christ and being effective salt and light. For a gift of any amount to Stand in the Gap, we'll send you an attractive Stand in the Gap signpost with four simple questions and corresponding biblical principles about the toughest issues of the day, helping you to successfully travel the road of life. Use as a bookmark in your Bible, affix to your refrigerator, or give to a friend. Yours for a gift of any amount to Stand in the Gap. Partner with us right now at StandInTheGapRadio.com. That's StandInTheGapRadio.com. Here's Twyla Braze with today's Health Freedom Minute. A nurse practitioner with a Doctor of Nursing degree was charged with fraud and fined $20,000 for using the title doctor. Now three other nurses with Doctor of Nursing degrees have sued the state of California where no one who is not a doctor can imply that they are a physician or surgeon. With 27 states allowing nurse practitioners to practice without physician supervision, the question of who can call themselves a doctor is a real issue. One state recently passed a law that requires doctors of nursing practice to clearly tell patients that they are not physicians or medical doctors. If someone claims they're a doctor or clinic staff say you have an appointment with a doctor, ask them if it's an MD or a DO. If they say neither, it's not a physician. Help us secure health freedom for all. Visit cchfreedom.org. That's cchfreedom.org. You're listening to Stand in the Gap today, discussing the pressing issues facing our culture from a biblical and constitutional perspective. Now let's rejoin our host. Well, we were finishing in that last segment about the idea that in the first part of this book, this new book that uh, is coming out by George Barna next Tuesday, which you can pick up and find there on Amazon, it's entitled Raising Spiritual Champions. And we're talking about children. And that was our last segment, talking about the importance of children and um, the fact that that they are, well— they're catching perhaps a whole lot more than they're taught, but they can be taught a whole lot more than you think they can catch. Um, and it has to, and it happens early. If you wait too long, you're going to find out what you have and what George and your research has found that by the time they get into high school years, they're departing altogether because something else has filled the void. That brings us to the point that is made in, in the first segment of uh, George's book, this new book, Raising Spiritual Champions, and it's about raising disciples. Now, while making disciples of all people, we know that's an inherent portion of, of the Great Commission, go into all the world and uh, make disciples. But it's often overlooked when we think of it in terms of making disciples of our children. And the goal of developing within them the mentality and the character of a spiritual 
champion, as we defined in the first segment, a, a, a hero of the faith, a potential hero of the faith if they make the right choices. So in part, the, the measurable failure uh, to make spiritual champions in our children's uh, stems in part from, I, I suppose, not understanding what the Bible says about disciple making when it comes to our children. But I suspect that the other part, from being a parent and talking to so many others, of many say, I don't really know how to do it. Well, in George's new book, Raising Spiritual Champions, he addresses this how-to aspect of discipling our children and what it takes to make a disciple. So, George, just get into that, because in that segment of your book, which is, that, that's a whole powerful segment there, you identify four practices uh, that I would say genuinely characterize or, or characterize genuine disciples, more or less, of Jesus Christ as the model, Jesus Christ being the model for discipling our children. Would you comment on these four overall and f- identify the first one, and let's try to walk through all four of these if we can in this segment? Yeah, sure. The first of those practices is making a life-defining commitment to be a disciple. You have to make that as a an intentional choice in your life. Now, in order to do that, if you're going to say, yes, I want to be a disciple of Jesus, you got to know what that means. And so in the book, I, I take people back into the scriptures and say, okay, let's look at what Jesus defined as a disciple. He was very clear about it. There are six particular things he identifies, you know, o- obeying his teachings, loving other disciples, producing spiritual fruit, loving God more than anything else, submitting uh, to God's authority, and surrendering your agenda to embrace His. Now, when you do those things, then you can actually be a disciple of Jesus. And part of making that life-defining commitment is that, uh, you know, you're, you're embracing a new identity. You're, you're giving away the identity that the world wants to hang on you, and instead you're saying, yeah, let Jesus now, because I want to be like Him. Being a disciple means you want to be like Christ. And so what's your identity? Well, you're going to be born again. You're going to be a new creation in Christ. You're going to be a servant of the living, holy God. You're going to allow God through his Holy Spirit to transform you. So you're going to be a transformed being, a holy person. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It means you're set apart for the purposes of God. And you're going to be a spiritual warrior. Recognize that every moment of every day is spiritual war. You can't avoid it. Every one of us is part of it, whether you acknowledge it or not, whether you realize it or not, whether you want to or not. And so you've got to pick a side. If you choose not to pick a side, you've picked a side by default and it's not God's side. You've got to intentionally choose to be a warrior for Christ. And so, you know, part of all that then, too, gets into worldview development. So this is what that first practice is, deciding that the very purpose of my life is to know, love, and serve God with all my heart, mind, strength, and soul. I want to be a follower of Christ. Hmm. I love how practical it is, how how simple you've made it yet it's it's so biblical it's uh, again speaking as somebody you know sam is talking as somebody with children grown children and grandchildren i'm speaking as somebody with children um w- wherever you are at whatever stage you're at in life the children in our church the children in our community we need to be reaching them as, as you already explained last segment and so these are such practical steps uh, i really appreciate that i appreciate that the whole book is like that what is uh, maybe a second practice that I think you, there's four of them and you gave us the first one. What's another uh, practice that is practical that we can do for, for discipling our children? Well, Isaac, if you've made that first commitment, yes, I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus. You go back to how Jesus defined it and you quickly learn, okay, next, that means that I'm going to have to accept the Bible as truth. I'm going to have to know the principles and commands that are within it. And I can only do that if I devote a lot of my time to studying God's Word, not just reading it, but really studying it and embodying it, saying, I want to own this content. And that's really what developing a biblical worldview is all about. 
And one of the things that I talk about in, the, in there is that the best way to start is what we've talked about on a previous program, the seven cornerstones of a biblical worldview. It's a great launching point. It doesn't give you the totality of a biblical worldview, but it gives you a very solid, strong foundation that you can build upon. And so that's critical. You know, so many times people say, well, yeah, I've read the Bible. Yeah, I, I, I'm committed to it. So, and then you ask them, well, what are the Ten Commandments? And they don't know. I mean, how simple does it get? And so people often ask me, well, why do people break the Ten Commandments? They break them because they don't know them. And in the same way, why aren't people disciples of Jesus Christ? Because they don't know what it takes to be a disciple. They don't know his truth principles. And, and you can't embody those truths. You can't own those unless you've studied them and you know them, you agree with them, and you want to be somebody who models that for everybody who's watching you. All right, George. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, choose to be like Christ. It's a choice. We encourage our children to choose to be like Christ. As parents, we guide them in the ways of God. We take them to God's Word, the admonition of the Lord, which you're talking about, George. Read the Scripture, view the Scripture as authoritative, and then choose to do it. Fear God, keep His commandments. It's basic what you're saying. You have a third practice. What is that, please? Well, it's once you've made that commitment, and then you've begun to really inhabit God's Word so that you know it, you believe it, you buy it, then uh, there's a basic principle of life, which is that you do what you believe. Well, okay, if you now believe these things, convert it into action. Prove that you believe it by the way that you live. And so the idea here is to adopt a lifestyle that proves that you're a disciple. So you translate your beliefs into behavior. You have conversations, Socratic conversations with the people who are mentoring you, coaching you, guiding you into being a disciple. And you allow them to hold you accountable to those principles. And you take seriously the fact that you are modeling those principles, and that as a result of that, you're now capable of producing fruit for the kingdom of God. This is one of the things that you offer to God. It's like, I love you so much, not only do I believe what you say and who you are, I'm going to live those principles, and because I'm living those out, I'm going to be uh, capable of producing other disciples. And that's what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who makes other disciples. That's one of the keys to knowing when you're a disciple. George, this is great. What, what would you say then the fourth, the last step then? Well, you can't just take for granted because you know and believe some stuff and, and you put some effort into it that you're doing a good job. You've always got to be assessing how well you're doing, measuring your practices, your habits, your output. And so you've got to have people who will help you determine objectively, how am I doing? You're going to take a look at uh, all these things that you say now are so important to you, and you, you're going to make claims about, I'm living like a follower of Jesus. I'm trying to live like Christ. Well, then, we ought to be able to see that in some of the objective measures of your life. How do you do that? You have conversations with other disciples, people who are proven disciples. They're living that life, and so they can watch you and they can tell whether or not you're making progress, whether or not you're doing what a disciple does. Uh, you, you need to have identified personal standards for how you're going to live so that you can evaluate yourself. You want to evaluate yourself. You want other people to evaluate you. And, and then you also want God to be evaluating you. So that's the process of taking time to be quiet, be still, be in God's presence. Let the Holy Spirit of God speak to you about who you're becoming, how you're living, what you're doing, what you could or should be doing. All of that's critical. And then there are external assessments that people like me who study these things, we've developed assessments that help people know, how are you doing as a disciple? So you want to put all of those things together, constantly evaluating, how am I doing? Because you want to get more and more like Jesus. That's what spiritual maturity is. It's not having been a Christian for a long time. It's becoming more and more like Christ over the course of time. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, raising spiritual champions. Well, think of making disciples like Christ. And then there are these four steps that are all in the book. Uh, Very, very practical. Very, very biblical, which is what makes it powerfully practical. Raising Spiritual Champions, this latest book by Dr. George Barnum. When we come back, we will conclude this program with some challenging questions. Eleven years ago, God changed my calling from standing in the gap for truth in public office to speaking truth from the pulpit in the public square. A dozen pastors linked arms with me, and God began to move. In the fall of 2013, ten years ago, the American Pastors Network began. State chapters were started. Stand in the Gap Radio and TV was born, and God's used so many of you to bring this to pass. Thank you, thank you. Now it's a perfect time to glorify God. Look to the next five years, should he tarry and invite you to help us reach millions more with a biblical worldview and the tools to stand in the gap for truth. Now, here's how you can help. First, mark your calendars and save the date of Tuesday, November 14th for our 10th anniversary Forging Ahead celebration. Write a letter of gratitude sharing how God's used this program in your life and prayerfully consider a generous 10th anniversary APN love gift. For more information, go to standinthegapmedia.org. Does your child struggle to learn in a traditional classroom setting? Do you find yourself wishing you could spend more time interacting with and training them in the ways of the Lord? Thousands of parents feel the same way, and that's why they've chosen to educate their children at home. This gives them the tremendous opportunity to not only ensure a biblical worldview education, but to instill Christian values and build stronger relationships along the way. If this sounds like something you're looking for, why not consider BJU Press Homeschool Resources? BJU Press offers a variety of programs tailored to meet your family's needs and accommodate your child's learning style. Their curriculum was created to challenge your child to think biblically and grow in godly wisdom while receiving an academically sound education. They offer traditional homeschool textbooks, online classroom, and distance learning. Take charge of your child's future by using BJU Press materials. Learn more at BJUPress.com. That's BJUPress.com. I'm Dodd Morris for Ruth Kramer with Mission Network News. Niger isn't just in political crisis following the power grab by the military junta. It's now an economic crisis. Before the coup, Niger had over 3 million people in acute food insecurity. That number will undoubtedly go up as sanctions hit and food aid piles up at Niger's borders with no way in. Along with distributing their solar-powered audio Bibles, World Mission will be getting food and water to those suffering. Please pray for comfort and provision. North Koreans know they can't rely on their government to help them. Eric Foley with Voice of the Martyrs Korea says that since the Great Famine in the 1990s, those who trusted North Korea's leadership have suffered greatly. Some rely on the black market to buy medicine and food, but North Korean Christians have seen God perform many acts of healing over the years, and their church has grown as a result. Please pray this growth would continue. Dot Morris, Mission Network News, the service of One Way Ministries. With a woman at look at culture from a Christian worldview, I'm John Stone Street with The Point. The number of teens experiencing symptoms of depression are higher than ever. According to research from Gene Twangy, 49.5% of teens report that they feel like they can't do anything right. Over 44% report that they feel their life's not useful. And almost 49% say they do not enjoy life. Each of these findings are roughly double what they were in 2009. These stats are the latest in the growing body of research, which demonstrates a significant link between teens' mental health and their usage of new media. The combination of smartphones, the internet, and social media platforms have proven dramatically harmful, especially when contrasted with students who spend time participating in in in-person activities. For families who hope to help their teens avoid or overcome depression, the best place to start is to restrict usage of smartphones and social media. And all families should be proactive in cultivating healthy disciplines with devices, as well as habits and choices that promote real-time in-person relationships. For the Colson Center, I'm John Stone Street with The Point. You're listening to Stand in the Gap today. For more information, visit our website at standinthegapradio.com. Well, as we uh, approach now the final segment of our special program today, uh, Dr. George Barna is our guest. Isaac and I have the privilege of uh, working with uh, Dr. Barna on a number of uh, aspects and 
He's a regular guest on this program, at least monthly, and has been for a long time. And, uh, George, I just want to tell you again how much we appreciate your ministry uh, over the years. Uh, as you say, what you do best, God's given you a gift, is doing research. And uh, that research has been so very, very helpful. Uh, it, but it's like, it's, it's like the Word of God in, in, in many ways. You, you, you have to go to it and then apply it. And what your research does and over the years is actually ascertaining cultural values and attitudes of people, then link it and compare it to what the Word of God says, and then out of that, then we have a measurement of where people are in their thinking and their behaviors and how it ought to become, all believers, more like Christ. And that's where you've been, and I want to thank you for that. Your book here, your latest book we're talking about today, Raising Spiritual Champions, you talk about nurturing children. That's the focus, nurturing children, their hearts and their minds and their soul. That's the way God has made us. We've talked about all of that. Your book puts all of this together, and we're just doing a high point today on this program. I know you've got a lot of... Um, uh, statistics and uh, and uh, supportive, um, well, mostly statistical, probably some empirical data in there that would support what we've talked about. But I want to encourage all of you who are listening, you can go get this at Amazon. I'm sure uh, that it will be extraordinarily beneficial to all of you as parents or church leaders or pastors or grandparents, because we're all in this together yet. Um, we have children. Or we know somebody who has. Uh, for grandparents, we have grandchildren, and we know somebody else who has. We are not done with our roles. We can be making disciples of younger people, um, certainly, um, as long as we live. And that's the important thing. Now, as we go to the conclusion here, th throughout the entirety of Scripture, um, uh, all parents, as we know, biblically, have the command of God. They have the command of God to do a number of things. Be fruitful and multiply. That goes all the way back to Genesis. Uh, we all have, whether we do it, choose to do it or not, is a different matter, but train up our children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And God gives promises to those who successfully do so. And he says the consequences of not doing so are really significant. Um, God's model is for earthly fathers. As you were listening to me, if you're a father, a grandfather, God has given, well, God the Father is our model for how we are to emulate what being a father is to our children. Uh, earthly wives, you ladies who are listening, wives and mothers, you are to emulate uh, the relationship and the attitude uh, to your husband uh, as the church is to relate to Jesus Christ. It's all laid out there in God's Word. Um, the Word of God is given to us all. That's our standard of practice to be followed. It's not somebody else that we copy. It's the Word of God and the principle that we put into effect. We go there to find out what God's blessings are, what God's commands are, and we try to build that into our children, fear and admonition of the Lord. That's God's plan. Now, some follow it well, some not so well. Some literally reject what God's plan says, reject it out of hand. Some totally embrace, as we know in Romans chapter 1, they actually re embrace Satan, and they despise God in everything that he says. So for the person who wants God's blessing today on them and their children, and they want to raise up spiritual champions of which every child out there can be a champion, a, a child can be confined to a wheelchair and never, ever, ever be able to fight a physical battle, the, con the contemporary definition of being a champion, win a battle. No, no, no. A spiritual champion is something totally different. God measures us differently. Every child can be that. So, uh, George, let's go back. In the last section of your book, you focus on how Media and church-based ministries in particular are impacting the lives of children. You talked to the Isaac a little bit about that in the last segment. And then you say how they can more effectively do it. In other words, a challenge. As we complete this, can you give a challenge to parents, uh, perhaps the media, the church, however you kind of want to wrap it up, uh, about how to not only do it, disciple our children effectively to make spiritual champions, but to do it more effectively? 
Yeah, I know we don't have much time, so let me just quickly touch on three points, Sam. The first of those is to recognize that arts and entertainment media are having more influence on the worldview, that is the development, even the spiritual development of our children, than anything else. And so as the parent, the one that God has put in charge of the child and his or her development, you've got to manage their media exposure. And in the book, I talk about there being four things that would be helpful to do. You know, you monitor uh, what media they're exposed to. You minimize the amount of it they're exposed to. You moralize the substance that they're exposed to. And you model for them what good media habits look like. Uh, so I'd love to say a lot more about that. We don't have the time, but that's why the book was written. But understand that when you do this, it is going to raise conflict. Your kids aren't just going to sit there and say, oh, great, yeah, take away my screens. Don't give me any time with my screens. You know, it's going to take backbone. But as a parent, maybe the key thing that we learn from studying effective parents is you've got to be consistent in how you're raising the kids. So even with media management, be consistent. Don't back down. Understand it's not going to be popular. Get over it. Secondly, you know, you've got to look carefully at the parent-church partnership. If you're part of a, a local church or a community of faith of some type, take very seriously the requirement of studying what that church is going to do for and to your child. Recognize that it's your responsibility more than anyone else, any other organization, to raise the child. The local church is there to help support you in your process. And so look at what they believe, what kind of communication they're going to have with you, what it is that they do to support parents. And choose a church not for your sake, because you love the preaching, you love the music, you feel comfortable in the building. That doesn't matter. Choose it based on what are they going to do with your children. This is all about how you raise them. And again, in the book, we've got all kinds of things about what we found from studying churches. What kind of church can, can you look for? And then finally, let me just paint one more portrait for you, one more profile of who you are as a parent trying to raise a spiritual champion. And that's that you need to understand that you are a spiritual warrior. Not only are you trying to raise your child to be a spiritual warrior, someone who fights in the army of God, someone who loves Jesus and will do what he asked us to do, but you need to model that. You need to embody that warrior life. And so go back to Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. The greatest spiritual warrior, human warrior of all time, the Apostle Paul, laid out what it means to be a spiritual warrior. Check it out. Embody those elements in terms of what you're going to do as a spiritual warrior, not just in terms of your fight for the Lord's kingdom, but also how you're going to raise your child, how you will fight for your child, how you will train your child to be a spiritual warrior. That's a critical part of the mentality that we as parents who know, love, and serve God want to have. Uh, George, thanks for being with us today. Isaac, uh, boy, you and I could engage George for a lot longer time here. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking about George's latest book, Raising Spiritual Champions. Mom and Dad, if you're listening, I hope that is your goal. Get the book. Go to Amazon and find it. Raising Spiritual Champions. Uh, a lot of truth, biblical truth, practical. We encourage you strongly. Go get it. Amazon Spiritual Raising Spiritual Champions. George, God bless you. Pray that God uses this book and keeps giving you strength. Isaac, thank you for being uh, with me. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with all of us. If you like today's program, tell a friend. You'll also want to hear Stand in the Gap Weekend and watch the nationally syndicated Stand in the Gap TV program. We present the news of the day truthfully, carefully, and consistently from a biblical worldview and constitutional perspective. If you're hungry for the truth, visit StandInTheGapMedia.org to find all our programs and the stations that carry them. While you're there, be sure to download our free app and support this ministry with your best financial gift. 
Then join us again right here Monday through Friday for another program of Stand in the Gap Today.